Next on Lectures in History, Purdue University professor Catherine Brownell teaches a class about political advertising in the 1950s, highlighting Dwight Eisenhower's presidential campaigns. She compares radio and early televised ads and examines what components made them successful. Her class is about an hour and ten minutes. Nothing perhaps captures the popular memory of the 1950s like the slogan, I like Ike. This idea, uh, that this pin that so many people wore around the campaign of 1952 and 1956 conveys a, a notion of nostalgia and simplicity. Uh, it really emphasizes this idea of the 1950s as this era of prosperity, where America was a world leader and the American people were happy in suburban homes with their nuclear families. I like Ike. It's so simple. And it conveys that happiness. This idea, however, is a myth. And it's a political construction. The 1950s, in fact, were, it was, an, it was a time wrought with racial discrimination, uh, conflict, intense political and social pressures to conform to a suburban ideal that imposed gender hierarchies and mandated heterosexuality in the law. It was a time in which anti-communism targeted the liberal reform impulses of the New Deal, and frequently anti-communists took away civil liberties. And these are all different, um, uh, different areas of political pressures uh, in terms of enforcing certain ideals and resisting against those that we will look at next week. But I like Ike as a political or I like Ike as a political construct shifted attention away from those divisions. Um, and it created a sense of consensus. Um, in many ways, again, this is a political construction. Um, and at the root of it was a very innovative and transformative marketing campaign that transformed a military hero into a political celebrity. And he used that attention to win the presidency. Often we think of John F. Kennedy or Ronald Reagan as ushering in the television presidency. But in fact, it was Dwight Eisenhower. Ike harnessed the power of television to win the presidency and to put forth his vision of America and the world. And this is what we are going to look at today. Dwight Eisenhower brought several important developments to the modern American presidency through his leadership style and his organizational approach. In doing this, he built on a lot of the transformations that we've already looked at this semester. For example, Franklin Roosevelt launched the executive office of the presidency. And last week, we looked at how Harry Truman expanded it uh, with the national security state. Dwight Eisenhower, however, formalized it. He ran his office very much like he did the military. Uh, the bureaucracy became a very entrenched uh, and well-focused and executed component of the American presidency under Eisenhower. For example, he had weekly cabinet meetings and he formed the Office of Congressional Liaison so that he could have a formal link to the legislative process. And this was especially important because throughout the 1950s, the Democratic Party controlled Congress. So Eisenhower recognized that to get things done, he needed to have a, a really smooth operation in terms of links with Congress. But he also brought uh, this organizational focus to the shifting media environment and transformed the White House into a production studio. And to do that, he worked very closely with Hollywood figures and Madison Avenue television executives and advertising companies to navigate the new mass medium of television that ultimately really transformed American political communication during the 1950s. So this post-World War II era is a, really a key moment to understand the rise of entertainment advertising, television, and Hollywood in American politics, because television really does drastically change the, the political scene during the 1950s. So the questions that I want us to think about today as we study this particular period 
are how does tel or television change leadership styles? How does it change strategies of political communication and qualifications needed to succeed politically? And the key question that we're going to come back to at the end of class is, does television revolutionize the American presidency or does it build on trends that are already in place? So to get at that question, we need to start by thinking about what are the trends that are already in place? Does television launch a significant break in terms of leadership strategies and communication strategies? So what trends are already in place uh, before the launch of television in the 1950s? What, is, what does Theodore Roosevelt bring to the presidency? Mm. Um, Theodore Roosevelt brought like increased media connections at the beginning of the 20th century um, to start formalizing the process of like the executive office and the media. Excellent. Didn't he also set up the West Wing as yes. a sort of source to have the press like within the White House yes. in order to have a connection with them as well? Yes, and again, these are key in terms of he valued the press. He saw the press as an asset, uh, something that he wanted to capitalize on their place to control uh, and help shape public opinion. Excellent. Caroline. Um, he also had the fireside chat, so there was already this idea of um, there is this personalized president that you can, ever, if every person has like a radio in their home, they can listen to him and he's, it's like he's speaking to them, so using like rhetoric that mm -hmm. is easy to understand and not super um, complicated political jargon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Franklin Roosevelt really brings in this idea of the fireside chat. Uh, so Theodore Roosevelt uses the presidency as a bully pulpit. He creates these relationships with journalists and, and again, uses public opinion to launch uh, and, and advocate for a very specific policies. Franklin Roosevelt take, takes this a step further. So he uh, capitalizes on radio um, and uses that to create an intimate connection with, uh, with the American public. And I'm going to play you a quick clip just to give you a sense of what this sounded like. Uh, again, thinking about if you were a listener, uh, you were tuning in your radio or into your radio during the 1930s to listen to your president. This would have been what you heard. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States. My friends. I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. To talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking, but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. What does he do? Just in that very simple uh, opening. He definitely per personalizes the the chat. He uses I, you, we, and he creates this personal link between the presidency and the people mm -hmm. so that they feel like he's on their side and that they also have a place in this huge bureaucratic mm -hmm. thing that he has begun to create. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Personalizing the presidency. Uh, that is so key. Uh, for those of you who looked at a lot of critics of New Deal prog programs, how does he bypass them with the radio? If someone doesn't agree with a particular program, what is he able to do with radio? He's able to directly appeal to the American people with mm -hmm. the radio and bypass, uh, like, say, newspapers that have editorial slants against New Deal policies mm -hmm. and just to work around old institutions that were against him. Absolutely. That's really key, uh, thinking about the power that this gives. It creates that personal relationship, uh, that intimacy between the president and an individual in their home. Uh, and then it also... <clears throat> allows him 
to to challenge the narrative. Uh, overwhelmingly, at this time, people got their information from newspapers, uh, and many newspaper editors were against the New Deal. Overwhelmingly, at this time, uh, newspapers were more conservative, were more critical of a lot of Roosevelt's policies, and so the radio becomes a, a new opportunity uh, to connect directly to audiences. And if you recall, it's not just radio that he uses. Uh, he also used theaters uh, and motion pictures to sell certain programs. Uh, he capitalized on the newsreels that would have been shown at the beginning of a motion picture feature. Um, but he also worked with a variety of different studios in Hollywood to create production shorts like this one, which promoted the National Recovery Administration. I drive it myself, sir. Uh, have a cigar. Keep your cigar and hire a chauffeur. And keep a man from becoming a loafer. You look like a grocer. No, sir. My job's extermination. You must give your assistants each a nice weekend vacation. And I'll need more men to kill the rats. We want you to hire a crowd. You'll do good work if you hang out the sign that means no rats allowed. What's the matter with you? I'm a very sick woman. Oh, a hypochondriac. You must get a doctor for pneumonia, a doctor for insomnia, one for osmosis and two for halitosis, one for amenia and one for eczema, neuritis, bronchitis, phlebitis, St. Vitus, or any other kind of anitis that will delight us. You must get a doctor for every disease you got. And that way you'll give you lots of enjoyment. And in that way, madam, you will help to end unemployment. Now listen to me, everybody. Step out in front. Get back at the get back at the president and give a man a job. You know he bought a front. You know that. I know it. So step out and give a man a job. You know who's in back of this in the NRA? No? Well, I'll tell you. And when I do, it'll give you heart of trouble. So what does this do that's different from the fireside chats? Oh, go ahead, Brent. Well, it turns presidential policy into an entertainment product. It, Absolutely. It's very much like the beginning of the whole concept of marketing. Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Kayla? Yeah, I was going to say, it takes, um, it's no longer the president advocating for himself, mm -hmm. but it's normal people advocating for the president that normal people would want the president and that they are very much for his policies and that he has caused all of this economic boom and all of these all of his prosperity within the country. Yeah, so the focus, uh, the hero of this story is Franklin Roosevelt, right? He's featured at the end, his portrait, 
But he has a variety of other people who are helping sell this. A comedian in this capacity, a variety of different celebrities come out for Franklin Roosevelt to do this. Radio spokesmen and radio personalities、um, all are selling the president for him. So again, a, a different kind of production team in terms of selling a particular policy. Excellent, Adam.、Um, it kind of creates the soundbite. So、yes. if you can take different snippets of what the guy was saying, so like give back to the president or give a man a job, those are easy to remember jingles,、mm -hmm. and so you can you could put those in some sort of radio advertisement or that just you know appeals to a more general audience. They're going to remember that message,、mm -hmm. whether or not they heard the whole song or not, or whether or not they heard. All about the different ways they can help. They're going to remember. Give a man a job. Absolutely, the slogan.、Uh, so again, bringing some of these features of advertising at this time and Hollywood,、uh, bringing them into politics to sell particular politi or particular policies. And the only reason you will not be humming "Give a man a job" later this day is because you're going to hum the "I like Ike" one because it's a lot catchier. <laughs> Lucas. Well, I thought it was interesting talking about you know. Holding the president up, but also using it as a selling point. Usually, when we think about selling a president or a candidate, we think of getting votes.、Mm -hmm. But in this case, it was actually getting the people involved in a specific policy.、Mm -hmm. So it's actually helping the common man or the middle class man to come out and. Without you, we can't do this. But with you, you can be part of this grander thing that's helping all Americans.、Mm -hmm. And that is really key as well when we think about media and new media、uh, and the presidency, because really effective presidents are able to use new media to win elections, but then also to govern,、uh, to use it as a tool to sell their agenda as well. And making that transition from communication on the campaign. Trail to communication once in office is really key, and this is why、uh, what、uh, what Dwight Eisenhower does with television is also really important because he follows that trajectory in terms of using new media to win an election and then reshape how he governs and how he sets the agenda, as Lucas pointed out. So again, we see a lot of the, the the new possibilities in terms of presenting an agenda, shaping public opinion, and promoting a personality that comes with、uh, radio and motion pictures. So, what about television? Does television bring something fundamentally new to American politics and to the American presidency? I want to throw a couple numbers out because I think it really conveys how dramatically television grew and reshaped、uh, American politics. In 1949, only 172,000 television sets had sold. That number jumped to over 52 million by 1953. This is an incredibly dramatic growth of a new technology that forced politicians to grapple with presenting themselves and their policies to voters through TV screens, rather than newspaper articles, radio broadcasts, or even these motion picture shorts. And one of the key things to think about. Is that this growth of a new technology caused tremendous anxiety and concern, and it's really important to understand that this is post World War II that it becomes so powerful. There was deep concern over the manipulative power of propaganda at this time, and the ways it could be used to undermine democracy and to promote totalitarian governments. After all, Joseph Goebbels and Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party in Germany had a very effective propaganda machine. Its ways—it's part of how they were able to consolidate power by limiting、uh, information over new media's. So too did Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union. And so these concerns about the manipulative power of, of new media、um, and even old media, motion pictures in particular,、uh, were really at the core of a lot of anti-communist investigations, particularly the ones that featured the motion picture industry in 1947. The central question that was debated in the halls of Congress, as a variety of actors and studio executives came to Washington D.C. to testify about their political activity, was 
were they using entertainment? Were they using their celebrity for undemocratic purposes? One anti, uh, anti-communist film critic told the House Committee of Un-American Activities that, quote, glamour is appealing. The communists have made shrewd and excellent use of it for their purpose. They are trying to bedazzle audiences with celebrity. And so this is a question uh, that pervaded uh, national politics. Is entertainment media, um, motion pictures, and this new media of television that people weren't quite sure what to do with, uh, is this going to undermine democracy? Uh, does it focus more attention on entertainment? Um, and does, can it be used as a way to advance communism? These were central questions that people had. So these fears of entertainment and propaganda and manipulation are really important to understand when we see the different ways that politicians grappled with television. Some of them embraced television and the opportunities that it had to offer, but overwhelmingly in the 1950s, they were very wary of it. And the, the argument that we don't want to manipulate others by embracing advertising, slick sales advertising in Madison Avenue, that really dominated public discourse during the 1950s. For example, the Democratic nominee for the presidency in 1952 and 1956, uh, Adelaide Stevenson, looked very disdainfully on the medium that sold presidents as, uh, as commodities. Quote, the idea that you can merchandise candidates for high office, like breakfast cereal, I think is the ultimate indignity to the democratic process, um, argued Adelaide Stevenson. He wanted to use this new medium to perhaps expand his message, to deliver longer speeches, uh, to emphasize his oratory, but not to use any of those slick sales techniques uh, that Madison Avenue executives were using to sell cereal. Uh, He wanted to use this new medium to perhaps expand the message that he was already delivering to audiences. And so what he did during the 1952 election is that he did allow some advertisers to create some catchy jingles for him, but he refused to be a part of that production. He said, if you want to do that the way that we did with radio, that's fine, but I'm not going to appear in these short advertisements. There's no way that I can talk about a policy in 30 seconds. So instead, Adelaide Stevenson uh, t- uh, worked with the Democratic National Committee and purchased longer chunks of time. Uh, so an hour, uh, perhaps, where he would then go in front of a TV camera and deliver a long speech about a particular policy. Well, what t- if you're going to purchase an hour of TV time and you have a limited budget, when will that time be? Any thoughts? When can you afford that time? Ryan? Uh, whenever it's cheapest. Absolutely. Which would probably be late at night when exactly. it's not prime time. Exactly. So when Adelaide Stevenson did appear on TV, it was late at night uh, when the only people watching uh, were perhaps those people who were committed Democrats that wanted to watch what Adelaide Stevenson had to say. Uh, so that's really the only time he appeared in these purchased um, periods on television. And he had his advertising team uh, make uh, ads, again, that reflected radio strategies. Um, so I'm going to show you two of them. Uh, and I want you to think about how these are perhaps more reminiscent of something you'd hear over the radio uh, than something you'd see on TV. Hmm. Had a farm back in 31. Conditions filled him with alarm back in 31. Not a chick chick here or a moo cow there, just broken down farmland everywhere. And Barbara Mack doesn't want to go back to the days when there wasn't a moo or quack. To the days of 1931, when he didn't have bread when the day was done. Farmer Mac knows what to do, election day of 52, gonna go out with everyone in the 
the USA To vote for at least Stevenson To keep his fondness way With a vote, vote here and a vote, vote there And a vote for Stevenson everywhere For if it's good for Mac, you see It's good for you and it's good for me All America loves that farm Vote Stevenson today and one more, and then we'll discuss. Ike! Bob. Ike! Bob. I'm so glad we're friends again, Bob. Yes, Ike. We agree on everything. Let's never separate again, Bob. Never again, Ike. Bob. Ike! Bob. Ike! Will Ike and Bob really live happily ever after? Is the White House big enough for both of them? Stay tuned for a musical interlude. Reuben, Reuben, I've been thinking Bob and Ike now think alike. With the general in the White House, who'd give the orders, Bob or Ike? Let's vote for Adley and John. <laughs> so Bob refers to Robert Taft, uh, who was the other uh, contender for the presidency in the Republican Party. And uh, he was the more conservative candidate. Uh, and Eisenhower was promoted at this time as the moderate uh, Republican. And so that, you know, makes a particular argument about their relationship. So what did you notice about these two commercials? <laughs> Caroline? Um, all the visuals were merely like ornamentation, mm -hmm. like like you mentioned earlier. These could have just been played over the radio, and honestly, it would have had the same effectiveness. And also, it doesn't really feature the any of the candidates at all, Absolutely. like facial facial wise. So then, people watching it might not like really make that rhetorical connection. Mm -hmm. Excellent, great, Brent. This might just be looking at things from like a modern lens, but they're not very good. <laughs> like. <laughs> From, from from the base standpoint of getting a stance across, <laughs> mm -hmm. we we don't know who Farmer Mac is. We mm -hmm. don't know what caused his farm to be bad and how voting for Adelaide Stevenson would fix that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a bigger problem with the first one than the second one. The second one just doesn't go anywhere. It's mm -hmm. 30 seconds of can I change the channel to see literally any other uh, <laughs> political advertisement, especially that really catchy I like Ike one that seems to be going around that my friends are talking about. Uh -huh. Excellent. Jack? <clears throat> well, it's a lot like what you see today where it's like slander campaigns where mm -hmm. it's just like there's you're getting nothing of yours across just just bashing everything what they do, mm -hmm. like talking nothing about you, just them. Just talking about all the negatives. Well, and that's what's really interesting is you do see that negative approach of uh, let's critique Eisenhower and critique the Republican Party. Uh, so that negative um, aspect is absolutely there rather than a, a positive message about why you should vote for the Democratic candidate. Noah? Yeah, it kind of seemed like the commercials were really just preaching to the choir because like the first one, uh, it was just saying like Adlai is good for farmers, but it doesn't say how. So like it seems like the only people that would be like, oh yeah, I agree with that, are people who already are familiar with those farming policies. And then like in the second advertisement where it's trying to compare uh, Ike and Bob, you know, it doesn't explain why. So I mean, the only people that are going to have their minds change, or actually no one is, it's just they're mm -hmm. going to see that and have their beliefs either affirmed or offended. Mm -hmm. So it's not Absolutely. really getting them anywhere. And, and I think that's really important, too, when you think about the Democratic Party at this time, is that media is, uh, is a side component. It's clearly not a priority uh, for Stevenson, for the Democratic National Committee at this particular time. Why? Where is the strength of the Democratic Party at this time? Why do they win elections? Ryan? It would be like remnants of Roosevelt's coalition Absolutely. from uh, the 1930s. And um, something else the first advertisement especially pointed out is like, look, look back to 1931. They're like, mm -hmm. look 20 years ago, mm -hmm. like when Republicans did bad things. I mean, I feel like in the modern era, 20 years ago is a completely different <laughs> environment than now. Um, so it's really trying to harken back to arguments they've been making for the last two decades. Excellent. Kayla? Yeah, I was going to say the you can see the contrast between the Democratic Party and they're they're trying to 
they're continually asking people to look back at what we've done, not even what Stevenson has done necessarily, mm-hmm. but what other Democrats have done and just linking that the party together. And that's the only thing that they share. But because he's a Democrat, he will be as successful as past Democrats, mm-hmm. whereas with Ike's campaign, it was very much looking towards the future and not because well because they they didn't really have a great past in recent years to look back to mm-hmm. that they would want to advertise so they had to push past that mm-hmm. and you can see that contrast here and also just like a lack of prioritizing media and honestly not like there's no creativity here mm-hmm. which would make sense because they didn't prioritize it mm-hmm. and i that definitely hurt them mm-hmm. in this and i think that that's really important uh, to think about that the democratic party has been in office for 20 years uh, that is a long time to control the white house and they had done so in a way that built a coalition with very specific new deal programs that gave benefits to voters uh, that that brought workers and farmers into that democratic coalition with all of the programs that we've looked at. And so they were relying on those structures of um, economic incentive uh, to uh, bring voters to the polls. They weren't worried about getting new voters. They just wanted to capitalize on the coalition that they had mobilized for the last 20 years. So in many ways, they're using the same strategies um, in terms of the rhetoric and, and who they're appealing to, uh, to turn out to the polls. Brent? Uh, On the subject of lack of creativity, one thing I just realized is both of those ads used already commonly known, commonly accepted uh, meters and and musical structures Mm. that they just twisted slightly. Mm -hmm. There there really was no creativity at all. (laughs) Or they they tried to build on familiarity uh, rather than bringing something new and innovative. Um, And so, again, I think it's really important to kind of think about that there's no one way that is predetermined of how American politicians uh, will turn to a new medium. Rather, there are a lot of different strategies at play. And even uh, even Dwight Eisenhower uh, was really reluctant to embrace a more Madison Avenue driven style and nothing really exposes the, the initial thinking of Dwight Eisenhower, like his announcement speech when he was announcing his candidacy in Abilene, uh, Kansas. And he turns out to a park in Abilene. It's rainy, it's stormy, and everyone tells him, we've got television cameras set up. You need to go into this barn to deliver your dress to TV uh, audiences across the country. And he says, absolutely not. I'm going to talk to my supporters here. And he was proud that they came out to support him. And he wanted to connect to the audiences that were in front or the audience that was in front of him. And so he endured the wind and the rain. And all of this was captured on a camera. And here is what it looked like. Forty odd years ago, I left Abilene. Since then, I have seen demonstrated in our own land and in far corners of the earth, on battlefields and around council tables, in schoolhouse and factory and farming community, the indomitable spirit of Americans. From this rostrum, looking back on the American record through these years, I gained personal inspiration and renewed devotion to America. There is nothing before us that can affright or defeat a people who in one man's lifetime have accomplished so much. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we can have peace with honor, reasonable security with national solvency. I believe in the future of the United States of America. in here what captured your attention Kayla I think if you muted this and yeah I think if you muted this you would think that he's out 
at war somewhere <laughs> speaking to his troops. I don't mm-hmm. know. Maybe it's because we know he's a he's a war general. Mm-hmm. But the the wind and the rain and his hair flying everywhere mm-hmm. and all of that. And he has like a very like grimaced expression. Mm-hmm. Um he looks like a war general, which I think is good for him. Mm-hmm. That's what he was running on. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. Excellent. Yeah, did anyone know that Eisenhower actually had hair until you saw this? <laughs> because you actually see his hair um, blowing in the wind. Uh, but later in the speech, it starts raining harder, and he can't really see through his glasses. So he's, he's you know, struggling with his glasses as he's reading the speech. Uh, Robert Montgomery, uh, at this time, is a Hollywood actor and uh, a Republican. And he watched this speech and he was horrified. Uh, He recounts how he immediately picked up the phone, called the Republican Party and said, let me work on your campaign with you. Uh, Because you're really missing an opportunity to shift from this idea of a military hero and emphasize that you are a political leader that you want to be president and you can command not just audiences in front of you, but audiences across the country. And so Robert Montgomery asked, can I work on your campaign? And he was not the only one. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower was friends with a lot of um, executives in New York City that worked on Madison Avenue, advertising executives. And they also worked very diligently with him to revamp his media strategy. He was originally very resistant to this. Uh, He did not want to make television such a priority in his campaign. But over and over again, uh, figures like Robert Montgomery and advertising executives like Rosser Reeves emphasized that you need to take television seriously. And you need to see that you can get something across. Uh, something meaningful across two viewers by embracing some of these production tactics. And so this is what his campaign looked like that was very different from Adelaide Stevenson. Uh, He uh, had this very catchy, I like Ike, um, an Ike for president uh, spot that I'll show you in a moment. But then he also had a very innovative uh, series of campaign spots called Eisenhower Answers America. So I want you to think about what this does uh, in terms of presenting Eisenhower as a personality and how perhaps this is different uh, from what we've seen with Adelaide Stevenson, but then what we've seen before in previous campaigns. So here is the first one, and this is the song that you'll be singing the rest of the day. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president. You like I, I like I, everybody likes I for president. Hang out the banner, beat the drum, we'll take I to Washington. We don't want John or Dean or Harry, let's do that big job right. Just get in step with the guy that's up, get in step with I. You like I, I like I, everybody likes I for president. Hang out the banner, beat the drum, we'll take I to Washington. We got to get where we are going, travel day and night for president. Let Adelaide go the other way, we'll all go with I. You like I, I like I, everybody likes I for president. Hang out the banner, beat the drum, we'll take I to Washington, we'll take I to Washington. Now is the time for all good Americans to come to the aid of their country. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for so this also uses cartoons, uh, but what does it do that's different from Stevenson? Tanner? <laughs> um, yeah, so for in this one, it kind of has more of a bandwagoning effect. Mm-hmm. And um, he even says, like, it's time for all good Americans to come together. So it brings up the notion that, you know, you should join in on this uh, party. Excellent. Great. Carolyn? Um, it is catchy in that it has like a chorus that mm-hmm. repeats rather than the like farmers one just kind of relied on the fact that everyone would know that song already. Mm-hmm. And like I'm in choir and we do a lot of like 40s and 50s music and this is very period esque. Mm-hmm. So people were already listening to music like this. So it already appealed to the masses in that pop culture idea. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And that's a really key point. <laughs> Lucas? 
Um, we've already commented on how Democrats were looking backwards in this mm -hmm. campaign and Republicans were looking forward. And I've looked at these before in the past, and one thing that always stands out to me is the sun rising at the end. Mm -hmm. And it really seems like it's a new day after this 20 years of Democratic mm -hmm. Democrats being in office. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So all of these different visuals, uh, the, the music, uh, the, the, the sound to it, they all emphasize innovation and looking forward and enthusiasm, creating that bandwagon that join us. Uh, this is something exciting moving forward. Don't you want to be a part of it? Uh, Ryan? I also notice how uh, the visuals were important because there was an allusion to Harry Truman within mm -hmm. the advertisement, and that's important because Truman is like on the campaign trail for mm -hmm. Stevenson, uh, even though he wasn't up for election, of course. Uh, so I think unlike the Democratic ads we saw earlier in the lecture, the visuals for uh, I Like Ike are in very important for... Um, selling the message of the advertisement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there still is a critique uh, of the Democratic Party in here. Uh, but the emphasis is definitely on that positive message that you don't want to be a part of that Democratic Party and Truman and what's been running for 20 years. You want to be a part of this party of the future. Well, I, I, have, I have two points. First, uh, to continue on the visual point, it really helps with the rewatchability. It's like yes. I mm -hmm. could probably recite not the Bob and Ike bit, because that was too boring to pay attention to. But the, uh, the other piece, I could probably recite that from memory after watching it once. But I Like Ike, it has all of these, those little visual subtleties, like uh, Adelaide Stevenson on a donkey riding in the mm -hmm. background in silhouette. Mm -hmm. That I didn't even catch that the first three times I watched that mm -hmm. video. Mm -hmm. I have watched it many times now. <laughs> um, but but also it, it's very personalizing mm -hmm. and digging into the sort of, I don't know if this had been explored in psychology yet, but it's the idea of peer pressure. I like Ike. Mm -hmm. You like Ike. Why don't you like Ike? Mm -hmm. You should like Ike. Mm -hmm. Everyone should like Ike. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and you know that it's Ike, right? Where in the Democratic uh, commercials, they didn't talk as much about Stevenson, uh, but this, you know the candidate, you know it's about Ike, uh, and Ike the personality is at the forefront of all of the catchy songs, the imagery, um, the, the, the slogans that come together to promote Ike the personality here. Uh, you don't actually see Eisenhower himself appear in this commercial. But uh, Rosser Reeves, uh, an advertising executive at this time, talked with Eisenhower repeatedly and said, we need to get you as an individual into these short spots. And he came up with this idea about Eisenhower Answers America. And the notion is that these would be 20 second spots, very short. And they would have different individuals asking Eisenhower a question about his platform, his policies, what he would do as president. And this is where Eisenhower was really reluctant, because this required him to spend an entire day in a television studio, rehearsing all of, all of these different lines. They, freak, they made him take off his glasses. He couldn't see. Uh, so they put really, really large <laughs> cue cards in terms of so he could read the lines. Uh, they, they worked on the lighting, uh, put makeup on him to make him look attractive. Uh, this is where Robert Montgomery, again, played a role in terms of thinking about how do we present actors and using all of those tools of the trade to present Ike here in a very effective, uh, efficient way. Eisenhower, again, was not happy with this, uh, but he reluctantly agreed to do it because he saw the potential of reaching new audiences. Uh, he did grumble along the way, and one of the most famous quotes in terms of a uh, critique that he offered was he was exasperated after an entire day of filming all of these commercials, and he said, oh, why don't you just hire an actor? Uh, and it really does kind of foreshadow the changes that would come in terms of who was qualified, how we think about the qualifications for the presidency. But I'm going to play a couple here, and I want you to think about how you see all of these production tactics at play with this spot campaign. Eisenhower answers America. General, the Democrats are telling me I never had it so good. Can that be true when America is billions in debt, when prices have doubled, when taxes break our backs, and we are still fighting in Korea? It's tragic. 
and it's time for a change. And then this one. Hmm. Eisenhower answers America. You know what things cost today. High prices are just driving me crazy. Yes, my mamie gets after me about the high cost of living. It's another reason why I say it's time for a change. Time to get back to an honest dollar and an honest dollar's worth. So what do you notice with those two really quick clips? Jack? Um, the big thing I noticed was that both clips, they were looking up at him mm -hmm. um, at a very steep angle, which is like putting him on a pedestal. Absolutely. Like, like hey, please help us. Like, we, like, we need help. Excellent. Great. Tanner? Yeah, so he kind of uses uh, Roger uh, Ross Reeves' um, unique unique selling proposition in this, and saying like with these short spots, he doesn't give he just gives simplistic answers. He's not giving very like uh, detailed, mm -hmm. like, uh, in depth uh, perceptions to it. So um, that's what I'd say. I have to say. Yeah, and he's refuting the slogans. Uh, You've never had it so good. It's a Democratic Party slogan. He's refuting them and. Not in a lot of detail, but he's saying, well, what about the cost of living? You know, and it tries to point to very specifics to refute the slogan. Uh, so it's not very specific uh, in terms of all the details that he gives, but it's a little bit more specific than the slogan. Uh, so that, again, with fifth, or 20 seconds, he can try to refute some of the Democratic slogans that, that they're running on. Excellent. Kayla? Kayla? Yeah, I think I think today I mean, we can laugh at these because you can clearly see him reading the cue cards mm -hmm. and that like very awkward pan to the front was kind of comical. But I think for the time, this is brilliant because it's it's a person and Eisenhower like together and they're talking to each other. It, it goes one step further than the fireside mm -hmm. chats. It It's it's not just personal, like personable over the airwaves it's personable in person with the candidate and the american people have a chance to directly talk to him about their concerns mm -hmm. excellent and again it uh it does personalize this conversation that ordinary americans um are talking with this presidential candidate it also if you notice uh the people they bring in allows him to speak to particular demographics Women, African Americans, uh, trying to bring them into the Republican Party. And the timing of these mattered. So while Adelaide Stevenson purchased longer chunks of time later at night, what the, Dem or what the Republican Party did is that they purchased expensive slots that were only 30 seconds uh, long, uh, that were maybe a minute long for the I like, or Ike for President uh, spot. And they purchased those at the end of the most popular shows. Uh, so frequently, going to Caroline's point earlier about how this fits in with the popular culture of the 1950s, when a show would end and this would seamlessly come on, you're capturing viewers who are already tuned in to a television variety show. And they continue to watch that because it fits in to those themes, that music that perhaps they're familiar or they're used to hearing. And so what this does is it creates an opportunity for Ike, the personality, to reach out to new voters uh, and to reach out to perhaps independent voters or people who had previously voted for the Democratic Party or um, to emphasize this idea that perhaps you haven't voted before. Uh, but they're going to reach out to people as media consumers. Um, and, and that's a word that was used uh, in their campaign and in studies of their campaign during the 1950s. This notion of how can we appeal to voters as media, cons or media consumers. Here is a, another innovation that they brought to the campaign trail uh, that you can find through the C-SPAN video library that has all of these programs. Uh, and this is their Election Eve program, where you see uh, Richard Nixon and Dwight Eisenhower uh, sitting next to one another, looking clearly uncomfortable on camera, but they, uh, they went on camera. And, and that's the key thing, is they went on camera the night before uh, the election, and they talked about uh, what they wanted to do in office and then it went the the election eve special goes from them to then showing scenes of them uh, eisenhower leading troops in world war ii and some scenes of them campaigning around the country uh, so again it gave that personal connection 
the Election Eve program from 1956 goes a step farther in that they organized uh, Ike celebrations all across the country uh, in San Francisco and Detroit, and they had cameras there uh, capturing the surge of support that Eisenhower had across the country, and it showed it. I uh, linked region to region uh, through this Election Eve special and then ended at the White House. So again, it's trying to create a national electorate uh, to overcome different divides in region um, and even class uh, and social status through television, trying to build a new constituency for the Republican Party through that language of television. And for the Republican Party and Dwight Eisenhower, it worked. A uh, media analyst after the 1952 election noted that Eisenhower and Republicans used this new medium more effectively to attract a wider range of voters and to bring in new people uh, to the Republican Party. And so I think that's a really key thing here, thinking about how you could use a new medium to bring in individuals that may not have been engaged in the, the political process before. Uh, they may not be invested uh, in voting like workers are, whose, whose negotiating rights depended on building that New Deal coalition, or farmers, who some of their economic interests depended on these New Deal programs. Rather, you're appealing to media consumers uh, and finding a way to get them invested emotionally into the political process. So, One of the effective things that Eisenhower does is he brings these innovations from the campaign trail to the White House itself uh, and transforms the, the White House into a production studio. Uh, and this is very literally. Uh, they, they took uh, uh, the, basement, or the basement kitchen of the White House uh, and turned it actually into a production studio itself with cameras. Uh, and he had the help of Robert Montgomery, who went from a campaign advisor on his media strategy to the first television advisor um, as an official function of the White House staff. And, uh, and he uh, ultimately, Eisenhower is researching ways that he can capitalize on television and get people interested in what he's doing um, as an individual from the White House. And so he experimented with television the same way that FDR had experimented with radio. And again, this is on purpose. Uh, what uh, Robert Montgomery talks about in internal memos is he says, FDR was very innovative and we need to pick up from where he left off and take the presidency into the next chapter um, with television. And so he try has a variety of different tactics uh, that he introduces. Uh, um, in, uh, in 1954, uh, there's the first televised cabinet meeting. Uh, this is also available through the C-SPAN archives. And I would show you a clip, but it is incredibly muddled. Uh, and I think that shows as to how it is not as effective. Uh, um, Eisenhower was really reluctant to have a televised cabinet meeting, but his press secretary said that this is a great opportunity um, to, like radio before, um, James Haggerty, his press secretary, said that television allows you to go to the people, quote, uh, and go directly to them without them having to read warped and slanted stories by the press. So again, that same way of using a new medium to bypass critical uh, coverage in the press and allow Eisenhower to connect directly to viewers. So he tries a televised cabinet meeting, but the issue with the televised cabinet meeting is that it was incredibly scripted. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, they set up cameras and people had scripts that they were literally reading, and it was clear that this was scripted. Uh, so yes, they talked about the issues of the day, foreign policy and economic challenges, but they did so in a way that didn't seem like it was actually a fly on the wall where you were seeing um, these policy discussions. Rather, it was just another opportunity to bring other figures of the presidential administration into the media eye to talk about policy. He also had the first televised press conference. Um, and this is a tradition that has become ingrained in the presidency ever since then. 
Uh, but again, he had reporters. Uh, it was televised, but it was not televised l live. Uh, he had reporters come in, ask certain questions of Eisenhower. But at the end of the day, uh, James Haggerty and Robert Montgomery uh, were able to edit and to cut uh, what they didn't like uh, from this press conference. And so some people celebrated these innovations as democracy in action. Others uh, lamented that it was White House censorship um, and news management um, and that this was just another form of manipulation. Perhaps the biggest innovation that uh, Dwight Eisenhower brings with television to the office of the presidency is the tradition that still persists to this day. And that is the idea of sitting at his desk and giving an address about a national, national crisis as it unfolded. Um, and I want you, I'm going to play this quick clip uh, to, what, of an address that he delivers uh, during the Little, uh, the Little Rock crisis, uh, when, uh, when the um, segregationist uh, who did not want to integrate schools in Little Rock refused to allow uh, African American studio, or students to enroll in their high school. Um, and so ultimately, because Brown v. Board had just recently been passed, uh, Dwight Eisenhower decided that it was his role as president to enforce uh, the Brown v. Board decision and send federal troops to Little Rock to ensure that these African-American students could enroll and to integrate the high school in Little Rock. And he delivers this address uh, during this moment of national crisis. Uh, during this moment in which he had just sent federal troops to the South to implement um, a national law or a decision that had been handed down by the Supreme Court. And so think about the controversies. We've looked at these debates um, over race and federal authority versus states' rights um, and how they've really embroiled American politics over the previous century. Um, and so it's this moment of, of crisis, and he uses television to frame what's happening um, as it is unfolding. And so this, again, I want you to think about how this is different from the newsreels and the fireside chats that Franklin Roosevelt used. ...office in the White House in Washington, D.C. We present a special address by the President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Mr. Eisenhower discusses the integration problem at Little Rock, Arkansas. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Good evening, my fellow citizens. For a few minutes this evening, I should like to speak to you about the serious situation that has arisen in Little Rock. To make this talk, I have come to the President's office in the White House. I could have spoken from Rhode Island, or where I have been staying recently. But I felt that in speaking from the house of Lincoln, of Jackson, and of Wilson, my words would better convey both the sadness I feel in the action I was compelled today to make and the firmness with which I intend to pursue this course until the orders of the federal court at Little Rock can be executed without unlawful interference. In that city, under the leadership of demagogic extremists, disorderly mobs have deliberately prevented the carrying out of proper orders from a federal court. Local authorities have not eliminated that violent opposition. And under the law, I yesterday issued a proclamation calling upon the mob to disperse. This morning, the mob again gathered in front of the Central High School of Little Rock obviously for the purpose of again preventing the carrying out of the court's order relating to the admission of Negro children to that school. Whenever normal agencies prove inadequate to the task and it becomes necessary for the executive branch of the federal government to use its powers and authority to uphold federal courts, the president's responsibility is inescapable. In accordance with that responsibility, I have today issued an executive order 
directing the use of troops under federal authority to aid in the execution of federal law at Little Rock, Arkansas. This became necessary when my proclamation of yesterday was not observed and the obstruction of justice still continues. So what does he do here? What power does this give him? Carolyn? So he, as the executive, shows that he is listening to what's happening mm -hmm. around the country and he's like the first one to, you know, have a stake in it. And he talks about the executive order that he makes. And of course, the Supreme Court subsequently has, I think it's Cooper v. Aaron, where they enforce um, like the Brown decision. But um, as the executive, he's showing like, yes, I am the figure that represents America and I'm here talking about this first. Mm -hmm. So I think that that primacy. Um, effect is really interesting and important. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Caitlin? Yeah, I was going to say he shows very clear executive power in this moment that I am the president of the, of the United States and you will mm -hmm. obey this executive order that I have um, am trying to enforce because of a Supreme Court decision. This is how our laws work. But also he doesn't directly call out um, he calls out like uh, the police there in Little mm -hmm. Rock, but he puts the emphasis really on these uh, demagogue extremists, the people, rather than mm -hmm. the government there, the local mm -hmm. government and Governor Faubus. I'm from Little Rock, so like, this yeah. is <laughs> important to me. But he doesn't really call out the local government there for not really enforcing anything, which I think is interesting because I think in some ways he's trying to, he's not trying to isolate and 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 push them away for not um, doing their job basically, but he's putting the emphasis really on the people and these mobs, and that they're you know they're out of control. But it's not really the politicians that mm -hmm. are really to blame for this. Why do Why do you think he does that? What's the goal? Because that's on purpose. Yeah, the way he, he frames it. I mm -hmm. think he's trying to like keep them in, like draw them into the party, especially mm -hmm. as there's they're kind of undergoing this shift between the, the Democrats and the Republican Party, like ideals, I think, are starting to shift in Southern Democrats, mm -hmm. that the idea of the Southern Democratic Party is is changing. And so he's trying to pull in Southerners and Southern politicians to into the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So at the same time that he is forced uh, to finally take a stance um, on the Little Rock crisis and send troops in, and he does feel that it's his uh, obligation as the executive to follow the, the law of the land. But at the same time, the Republican National Committee is undergoing a variety of studies uh, that they call Operation Dixie, where they're thinking about ways in which they can capitalize on the divides that are growing in the Democratic Party between uh, Southern uh, conservatives uh, and, and uh, more liberal Northern Democrats that want to act on civil rights. So it's a really calculated move in terms of how he frames it that you absolutely uh, uh, hit on. Excellent. Firstly, I find it kind of ironic that he chose Andrew Jackson, of all people, to talk about <laughs> when talking about the enforcement of a Supreme Court decision, mm -hmm. given that one of Jackson's most famous decisions was not to listen to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. in the case of the Indian Removal Act. But also... One, one thing he makes very clear is this is, uh, to continue off of the, the absolving government point, he makes it very clear that this is a last resort. It, mm -hmm. It's very much the people are not listening to what has been said previously, so we have to send mm -hmm. the army in to enforce this decision because we are a nation of laws and those laws must be followed. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Great. Right. I want to highlight what Eisenhower said at the beginning. He was like, I've come to the White House um, when I could have just been in Rhode Island, and that's clearly for the visual um, yes. aspect of this address. Because it was over the radio. It doesn't matter where he mm -hmm. is. Um, but he goes back to the White House to, one, lend credibility to what he is saying and to, to draw comparisons to those presidents he mentioned, uh, even barring the whole, you know, mm -hmm. Jackson not respecting the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, he's trying to lend legitimacy to his actions mm -hmm. and the actions of the federal government through the location that he's giving the address. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very key. Uh, you're absolutely right. He recognizes the visual power of the Oval Office. 
Um, and this is something that presidents time and time again will uh, continue to invoke that visual power and they will use these addresses uh, from that very same spot uh, to talk to the country in moments of crisis. Uh, and so, again, this is a really new development that Eisenhower recognizes uh, in terms of shifting the power dynamics. And as you and Caitlin mentioned, overwhelmingly, it's the president that's taking action. Uh, and the president uh, dominates television, uh, in, especially in comparison to Congress at this time. So it's part of that visual shift in terms of who is taking action, who is leading the country, um, that's centering more in the executive branch uh, than in the the legis legislative branch. So to get to the question that we started with today, uh, does television revolutionize the presidency or does it just build on trends that are already in place? Does something fundamentally change with television in the presidency? Caroline. Hmm. Um. I think it's a mix of both. Like, I know mm -hmm. that's not the best answer, but um, like, obviously, the there are <laughs> trends. There's always trends in the media. And even just within the presidency, we talk about um, Teddy Roosevelt being the first personality president. And then that translates into FDR's radio addresses, where he uses rhetoric that everyday Americans can understand. But I think the biggest thing with television being introduced into the presidency is this idea of a media institution. Mm -hmm. um, Douglas in her article gets into that a little more later with like Kennedy, but this idea that there are these agencies now, PR agency, like PR as a profession comes into existence in this era because there is this idea that there is a way to use media, not even paid advertising to make your message more known and make it seem credible and make people jump on board with it. And mm -hmm. this idea that there are these also these like norms that have to be addressed and understood with television as well. So um, I think the idea that there is this institution behind television, mm -hmm. not just um, the like, not just the medium itself, not just the fact that it's visual, but that there is an institution surrounding it is really mm -hmm. important in what changes. That's excellent. A great observation. And you actually saw that in the beginning of this, where if you notice, they, they showed him walking up to his desk. They showed the TV cameras and frequently footage of Eisenhower in the Oval Office would show that that production scene around it. Newspapers would report on that and say, oh, the real excitement was behind the camera. And they would describe what was happening. So there is an education that the entire public gets about how media as an institution works uh, that comes with the, the use of television and the implementation of the studio in the, in the Oval Office. Excellent. Tanner? Yeah, I, um, I'd like to bring a point, like, with television now, um, it's going to bring a lot of more transparency to the executive branch um, now that they do have visuals and it's being more personable, like when they get into families' homes and they're gathered around uh, the TV and get to mm -hmm. watch the actual president give speeches and address certain agendas and everything else. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Great. Ryan? I think the use of television is revolutionary in the fact that it, changes who can be major party candidates. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it would have been much more difficult for FDR with his polio to be a successful president in the 1950s because uh, his campaign and staff was always doing everything they could to um, play down mm -hmm. his physical ailment. Um, but instead, with television, it's much easier to use that cult of personality that Roosevelt used to appeal to the people. And then I think you'll see later candidates and Kennedy and Reagan use uh, different backgrounds than, say, the party politics that uh, Truman or mm -hmm. McKinley or any of the a lot of the antebellum presidencies uh, presidents came out of. And that, I think, is the biggest change that television creates on mm -hmm. the presidency. Excellent. Yes. In turn, it challenges party structures uh, and allows for those people who can command media attention to not have to negotiate and wheel and deal uh, behind the scenes to gain uh, power and privilege within the party, but to go to the public. Uh, and you know, this does set up very nicely what comes next on Thursday, which is the 1960 election when John F. Kennedy does exactly that. Brent? Sorry about the delay. Uh, but what I was going to say is 
also on the opposite side of that, uh, as Kelly mentioned in in their article that we read, uh, you had things like the uh, Eisenhower Nixon research group that sort of codified a party machine version two. It was less about being the kingmaker and more about taking what limited money they had, which it was millions of dollars. It wasn't limited by like normal scope, but it it was. They they did have a budget mm-hmm. and figuring out what the most effective way to spend that money mm-hmm. was. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Excellent. So new challenges uh, within the, the party itself to think about how to adapt and take advantage of the media landscape. Um, and then the role of individuals uh, that then uh, who are not out or are not a part of the party um, can think about ways in which they can foreground themselves to make the party take them seriously. Uh, And that, again, is something that Stanley Kelly uh, talks about, uh, notably in this particular excerpt. Uh, And I'm going to give you um, a a brief second to to read this. Um, And it's part of the reading, but I think it really gets at the core of what you're talking about in terms of changing party structures uh, that happen because of public relations and television. So if you're a candidate uh, that is looking to win a presidential nomination from your party, uh, and it's really telling that this is uh, Stanley Kelly Jr., which you read for today. He's a political scientist at Princeton, and he's one of the first people to actually study uh, this question of public relations and power dynamics, uh, how this new industry of public relations is shifting the power dynamics in American politics during the 1950s. This comes out in 1956. Uh, if you are an astute uh, an eager uh, public official, and you want to think about a presidential nomination, how would you take this advice that he gives and perhaps apply it uh, to your campaign? Caitlin? I think you have to become a celebrity. Absolutely. Uh, within your own right, somehow, politically or otherwise. I mean, you could be Reagan and be an actor or and a, you know, a radio talk show host Mm -hmm. or something Mm -hmm. on the radio that he did i don't remember or you know you become a political celebrity but either way you have to make publicity for yourself Mm -hmm. in order to capture the public imagination before you even start talking about your policies Mm -hmm. um, in order to get that attention that you are a person and that you you're seeking this nomination and that you you're you're like a person of the people again a celebrity Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Excellent. The, the, um, the importance of a systematic, large-scale, privately sponsored publicity buildup in order to gain political legitimacy. Uh, and this is something that John F. Kennedy studies and recognizes and uses uh, in his campaign to win the Democratic nomination in 1960. And it's notable, as we will talk about on Thursday, that his challenger was Lyndon Johnson, the most powerful Democrat in the country, uh, that had all of the authority of uh, of working within the Democratic Party since the time of the New Deal, building up his credibility and his authority, his ability to manipulate votes in the Senate. Uh, Those two were the leading contenders uh, for the Democratic uh, presidential nomination in 1960. And it's very telling that John F. Kennedy is on the ticket as president and Lyndon Johnson is on the ticket as vice president. And so how that came about uh, and the 1960 campaign, when we have all of these conflicting ideas about who should have authority, all of that will be the story we look into on Thursday. Great job today.